long before recorded history, primitive man discovered that the molecular readjustment of the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms in a watery solution of fruit pulp which had been allowed to stand produced a beverage which made the world seem a wonderful place. Fermentation was regarded literally as a gift from the gods and seems to have been arrived at by widely separated peoples who used whatever was at hand that would take on the new and magical charm not present in the fresh juice. Dates and honey were tried with satisfactory results, the palms of the tropics, mare's milk, and in Mexico the sap of the maguey. Alcohol is a snap to make. It will even make itself. Julian P. Pappy Van Winkle Sr., at present writing the nation's oldest active distillery executive, tells the story of a Kentucky fabricator of Mountain Dew who was apprehended by a revenue officer. The moonshiner insisted that his jug contained nothing but spring water. The federal agent took a swig, choked, and insisted that the mountaineer sample the contents. What do you know? the old man sputtered. The good Lord's gone and done it again. There is some debate as to whether the North American Indians may not have been one of the few peoples of the earth who did not know how to obtain alcohol. In any event, they made up for lost time once they became acquainted with the Frenchman's brandy and the cheap fiery rum of the Bostonnais. Fermented drinks and social development advanced together. Alcohol may have stimulated the beginning of agriculture and a settled way of life. Alcohol entered into religious observances at a very early date, for it seemed to possess a spirit, or perhaps it was itself a spirit. The flowing bowl introduced a touch of civilizing ceremony, the graces of politeness. And sometimes ancient man found himself to be very, very drunk. Thus the risks became known as well as the benefits conferred by vinous liquor. Christianity and viticulture spread in Western Europe together. One of the miracles ascribed by monkish chronicles to St. Remy in the 6th century is commemorated by a bas-relief on the north doorway of Reims Cathedral, where the saint is shown making the sign of the cross over an empty barrel, which reputedly and miraculously became filled with wine. Although a concentration of up to 15% alcohol can be obtained by fermentation, the possibility of beverages of greater strength had to wait upon the invention of the still. The process whereby alcohol is first developed in a fruit pumice, or a mash of cracked grain, then vaporized by heat, caught again in a cool coil, redistilled, and fashioned into a beverage of potency, finesse, and solace, constitutes an old and respected art, described intelligently by Albertus Magnus in the 11th century. But long before Albertus put it down in good, strong, black and white, some ingenious or lucky man had discovered that alcohol and water have different boiling points. Despite their strong affinity for each other, they can be separated. So an alembic or crude still was devised. Out of it came a raw, searing, formidable, but drinkable distillate, direct ancestor of our western rivermen's tiger spit. Thus, in some such way as it has been briefly sketched, wines and malt liquors and spirits began their long and tempestuous career as curse and boon. There is nothing in alcohol itself which is poisonous or injurious to man's health, despite a large propagandistic literature to the contrary. Indeed, the bloodstream of the average healthy human normally contains a small amount of it. William Jennings Bryan, the advocate of unfermented grape juice, John B. Goff, the great anti-whiskey orator when he was sober, even hatchet-wielding Carrie Nation, she too had 0.003% of alcohol frisking through her arteries. There is quick energy, but no vitamins and minerals in alcohol. The pink elephants and other terrifying hallucinations associated with excessive indulgence in alcohol are brought on by a deficiency of vitamin B1. Millions have enjoyed alcohol. Millions have abused it. Millions have come to hate it. The peoples of the world have reached no final decision about it yet. They probably never will. But the reasons for drinking are not likely to disappear, since they include such disparate motivations as revolt, despair, anodyne, compliance with social custom, casual pleasure, and a lifting of the veil in which drink maketh glad the heart of man.